Welcome back to part two of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way, featuring our special guests. Now let's dive right back into the conversation and continue exploring their incredible journey. So if we were working together, or you as my boss, or I was your boss, what would you hope that I would do to connect with you on a deeper level then? So we could I, make the relationship thrive, but also the business thrive. I would want you to hold my mind in mind. So I would want you to be curious about my mind. I'd want you to ask me questions about what is that like for me? What impact does that have on me? What what reactions or, or feelings are getting stirred up for me? And then I want you to validate that. And that is how I would feel like my mind is being held by you and that I matter to you. And when I feel like I matter, I feel like I can, I can do anything. I, 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 I believe in what we're doing together. I, I want to be here. I want yeah. to be of service. So that reminds me, I'm going to, I'm going to put this picture of you and I took this down because I really resonate with this. <laughs> you get nervous when I hold a picture above you. I don't know what you're going to put up. <laughs> <laughs> um, it'll go on the big screen as well, but I was, I thought this was quite powerful. And for those that are listening on audio, it reads 50% of employees have a job, have left a job to get away from a manager. Now I know mm. I've done that on uh, a few occasions. <laughs> You've left. I have. Yeah. Well, you know, m my, um, my bullying scenario, I, I couldn't leave because I was sponsored to be in Australia. And ah. I think that's why it physically affected me um, so badly mentally and physically in the sense that I was throwing up uh, three out of the five mornings in my front garden before getting in the car to go to work. Mm. Um, it's probably why suicidal thoughts entered my head because I, mm. I couldn't escape. And I've only really in the last two years since leaving another job where I've really kind of opened up and been open and honest about that because mm -hmm. I think I always felt like, oh, you're just bringing it up because you went through a bad time. Well, no, it, it's, it was the truth. And uh, mm -hmm. I was probably ashamed to admit it, um, but I wasn't anywhere near doing it. Don't get me wrong. I, I was not at that step. It, it was just the thoughts entering my head how to to make this easier. But obviously I knew deep it was never going to make it easier. I, I, I totally get it. But I couldn't escape because I was sponsored. If I was in England, probably would have left a lot sooner. Um, but I couldn't leave. I could have gone and got... Yeah, I was trapped. Yeah, and that's why I was. my body was reacting in the way it was reacting. And then when the truth eventually came out, um, I did lose friends or I lost connection because I don't know if they could, f they never deep down and I get it. They, they would have never known who was right and who was in the wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, even if they knew my character that, you know, obviously it came into question. Um, but the, for the, for the most part, the truth came out and everyone kind of, you know, understood what the truth was. And, but even after that, when they were no longer in the workplace, I suffered with anxiety and I suffered with uh, paranoia. Meeting scared me and I would trigger a lot of sweating. Um, I'd go, I'd, and again, I'm opening up for the first time with you here, open, if they were to watch it, they're probably not, so I'm, but even if they are, they, I would go to the toilet seriously like eight, nine times a day to mm. take my shirt off and to dry it because I was sweating mm. with anxiety. And that's not because it's hot here in Australia. It was, and I thought it might've been, but it was to do with, the, I was doing it in the cold as well. And this went on for years later, years. It was only since I became a casual teacher where I got over the fear of the unknown, where that mm -hmm. stopped. And I did a lot of work on myself in terms of how I ate, putting water into my body, walking mm -hmm. in the sunlight, getting rid of sugar, all of that cold exposure, mm -hmm. that it kind of reduced it, but I was, I, I do believe that was coming from that place of trauma and my body was kind of yes. recovering. That and, was a um, trauma response, certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I never looked at it as trauma, mm -hmm. trauma because, you know, I had a lot of people in my life, some who were close to me, um, would say to me, oh, you know, you're just you're not getting along with somebody. Mm -hmm. I was 32 at the time. I'm okay with not getting along with people, believe it or not. Even though I'm a connection person, I mm -hmm. want to be friends with everybody because mm -hmm. the running joke is that I do want to be friends with everybody and I like to talk, as you can probably tell. Um, but, I, you know, I, I'm okay with not getting along with somebody. Sometimes we just don't vibe. That's all right. But we can still be kind. 
we can still be respectful. We can still work alongside each other, especially when we're working with children. And um, that just, you know, it was a lot deeper than that. And I'd never heard of the term gaslighting before. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm, I'm not here, obviously, to defame them. They've, they've got their side of the story. Um, but I, again, I've never really spoken about it. It's actually down here. I won. I can't believe I'm doing this, but I'm going to do it. I won the um, National Teacher of the Year Award in 2014. So this was this was the the plaque. I'll put it down now because I get a bit embarrassed by it. Uh, and I'm I'm not I'm not sharing that because I want everybody to know it. I'm sharing it because I think I think that kind of brought out something in other people, and I never wanted that thing. I, I really I really didn't. Afterwards, I didn't. I mean, at first, I was a bit, oh, what's going on here? Because I didn't know about it. But it was supposed to be something to celebrate and be proud of. But there was just a lot of running comments for months afterwards. And it kind of, at first, it was funny. And then you kind of get over it. And then, I don't know, I think these people just came out to me. Maybe I brought insecurities out in them. I don't mm -hmm. know. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I, all I wanted to do was turn up and be friends with them. And sometimes mm -hmm. they'd say, you know, don't come to work to make friends. I remember that. I'm like, well, I'm not asking for dinner, but mm -hmm. I am. I, I, why can't we be friends? When you spend eight hours a day with somebody, you spend more time with them than you do with somebody at home. Mm -hmm. Why on earth can we not be friends? Mm -hmm. Or at Especially least friendly. When, or at least friendly, yeah. But mm -hmm. I mean, even still, why can't we have that vibe? Especially when we're trying to connect with kids. Mm -hmm. we should be, ah, anyway, I'd be here all day if I talk about this. So... Mm -hmm. Um, that's where kind of my journey, I suppose, began with that. Sorry, my wire's trapped. Um, I don't want to break it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I've gone with that. I've kind of lost myself, I suppose. Well, but I it... think it's a really important point, Andy, because what you're talking about there was a sustained nervous system response to your environment. So the nervous system I'm, I'm not, and this is something I talk about in, in my program, so I, I can yeah. leave it a bit more, more for a bit later, but the nervous system has two ways of coping. It can either go up into what we call hyperarousal, which is that, that um, fighty, flighty, panicky or anger response, or it shoots down into what we call hypoarousal, which is that really shut down, depressed response. And often often after a period of being stuck in hyperarousal, the fighty flighty response, it has to go, it has to retreat back into a depressed spot. And that's when the depression can really kick in and take over. Mm. So uh, clearly you're having, your, your nervous system is detecting so much threat and it's having this huge response. Like it was such a physical and emotional response for you, I can hear. And, um, and you were doing your best to try and, 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 and do your job whilst your body's giving you so many huge signals of danger. Uh, I can't imagine how difficult that was. And, um, yeah. and for you to have, how did, did you eventually come decide to leave that job or how did, how did that happen? Um, so um, it went on for around six months or so or just under, but, we we always got along the the year before we got along and then we found out we're in the same team and, and I'll, I'll admit i was super excited mm. um, but then we had a a negative conversation about something it was just a matter of opinion it was different and i walked away thinking well, that was a good professional conversation we had a different of opinion but that's okay um and we we resolve it because i thought because we used to have banter in the staff room we had such a laugh i used to look forward to having a good chat with her at, you know with them at lunchtime mm. and um then we're working together and um my best friend was in there as well and, and we had a good connection and she just didn't see it the my friend didn't see it so she mm. would you know and she's apologized since and she's been amazing since but for months she didn't see it and um mm -hmm. she just said i don't, don't think you could get along and that's pretty much the extent of it so i'd, I'd stop going to her because i'd say these these things would be happening these mm -hmm. which at the time i didn't know was gaslighting but uh um, gaslighting situations and something would happen I'd go no one's around mm. oh my god but then it would be nice as pie to me in front of everybody 
Mm. And I'm like, what on earth? Mm -hmm. So then I started to doubt myself. I started yeah. to believe it was me. Yeah. Um, I really went into a shell of a person. I stopped pretty much talking. Uh, my partner at home didn't really know what to do. She would cry on the phone to her mum going, I don't know how to help him. And mm. um, and, and probably my dog was just lie with me the whole time and um, I wouldn't know what to do. And then I would stay up till super late because I didn't want the next mm. day to come. And obviously I'd eat crap at night because it filled mm -hmm. in that hole. Yeah, and, um, yeah, so over a long period of time, started to undo themselves which i didn't necessarily see but then um they 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 pushed some papers into my chest in front of people and that kind of opened the door i suppose mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um opening that door and the principal actually hugged me that morning and said uh, don't worry i know what's going on at my school and i think and i didn't know that he he'd seen so i um yeah, uh, and he hugged me, and I was like, wow. And I suppose oh, that yeah. kind of relaxed me a little bit. And then later yeah. that day, I was attacked again for not being a teammate, uh, not being a good teammate anyway. <laughs> Look, I have many flaws. But one mm -hmm. thing I don't think anyone can fault me on, I'll do anything for anybody in the workplace, mm -hmm. in the team. You know, if you want me to go and do that photocopying, or oh, you want me to go and do some printing for you because we're getting ahead for next week of planning for the kids, mm. I'll do it. I'm because I know it'll come back. And if it doesn't, that's okay, because I feel good doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, she, they, they came to me about being not being a good teammate, and uh, oh, I lost it, absolutely lost it. And I've never lost it like that before. I saw a red line, mm -hmm. um, and um, I lost it. I didn't obviously hit anybody. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I just, cloud came over my eyes, mm -hmm. red mist. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then after that, um, I turned around and fell to the floor and mm -hmm. cried my eyes out and crawled away because I couldn't walk away. Um, a colleague came and got me, took me outside, and then um, we had the restorative chat. And um, the next day, and I, I, I just let everything out. Uh, it needed to come out. There was no going back. And then it, it did get worse. But I, I won't, I won't share that bit on on air because yeah. um, that did affect somebody else. Um, mm -hmm. And then, but then the truth came out of. Of, of those two separate scenarios to, that came together and mm. um they were they were no longer back there the year afterwards but that's when i thought oh I'll, you know i'll have a good year because i can just be free and they're mm. not present but no um yeah. they were living in my head and uh, paranoia mm. and anxiety setting where i'd be triggered by meetings it was those mm. i always used to look at those triggers or oh, that word mm. here we go you know yeah. and um, it was so right i'd be triggered by meetings i'd be yeah. triggered by walking down that corridor um going into team so then i was i would doubt myself in planning because i used to see the eyes rolling in meetings and oh you can't mm -hmm. do it that way you can't do that way the ideas would be taken from me presented in a meeting that i'd said days before and i'm like but if i turn around and say mm, that's my eye well hold on a second i gave i said that to you i look like the crazy defensive child mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah you can probably imagine with the line of what you do and yeah, yeah. so you know oh, oh my god i'm opening up to you here it's not about it, me, but um, yeah. So, but what a what a what a uh, the word wonderful was going to come to what came to mind, and it's not wonderful that you went through that, but that demonstration of how insidious um, it can be in a workplace, how unsafe it can feel, even when there's physical safety. If you mm. don't feel emotional safety, mm. then that creates all sorts of a trauma and dysfunction inside and really affects your ability to do your work. How can you connect with children when you're feeling so unsafe inside? And I think that's where then comes to me about uh, on a bigger scale, kind of what you're doing with honoring minds. Uh, and mm -hmm. I will show that whilst we're on it, by the way, plug it. Um, is going to that. So I could impact a small classroom. Mm. But that wasn't enough for me. I wanted, mm. that's where my purpose came about being the leader I always needed was I want to help leaders be leaders and I want to be, I want them, I want to go to the department, I want to go to the government so it can all fizzle down across the nation. That's where my mindset's at. Amazing. They're not going to look at that. They're not going to accept it. They're not going to bring me in to do that. I get it. That's why I lead in our own ways here mm -hmm. because I can impact in a different way. Yeah, But if I wasn't doing lead in our own way, I feel that's where we connect because I would be doing probably what you're doing mm. um, in terms of, but with the Department of Education or yeah. 
Does, does that make sense? But I know they don't want nor believe that's what they need, but they mm -hmm. do need it because leaders are becoming leaders because they're experienced in their job, not mm -hmm. because they're good leaders or they're not becoming coordinators or learning specialists or principals in the Department of Education because they're just doing it because they're good educators or they're good um, business people. But do they know how to lead? Mm. That's what really grates my mind, you know. Um, mm -hmm. They're in that position because of probably length of service or they're not. And it's not all their fault. It's up to them, the next people above them, to be doing what you're doing is coaching them and teaching mm. them and giving them leadership lessons. You know, it's like being mm -hmm. parent, in, like Simon Sinek says. I know you you like a bit of Simon. You know, oh. it's not, you, not everyone should be a parent. Not everybody wants to be a parent, and not every, but we all have the capacity to be a parent. Same mm -hmm. with leadership. We all have the capacity to be a leader. Mm. But does it mean we want to be? And does it mean we should be? Mm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Your, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I, I, I completely agree. And I initially started off doing research in this area in leadership with teachers and people in the education system. And it was very uh, evident to me how, how um, there's so many teachers that are feeling so unsupported by uh, those in, in leadership above them and, and then those in the leadership above them feeling unsupported by by um, the framework of the education system. So it it um, I actually felt quite um, sad uh, talking to some of the teachers and hearing some of their stories of um, how just alone they feel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think that's what I heard from you as well was this sense of feeling alone with it. And that's where the trauma really comes from, the sense of powerless and, and feeling alone. So that's why connection is so important and being a connection-focused leader is so important because it can take away that aloneness. And that that then creates this beautiful buffer that, you know, it's hard enough being a teacher, let alone being feeling very isolated inside. Mm. So it's the same in many professions. It's hard enough doing that job, let alone feeling alone with it. It's like hard enough parenting, let alone feeling alone with it. We need connection to be the buffer that protects us from how hard the stresses are of the job. Yeah. The only thing I always hear is we just don't have time. <laughs> so how does that change? You know, how do we, it, it all filters down. I have a threefold plan that, because I'm actually interviewing one of the secretaries that works for the Victorian uh, state here uh, by the way you're in uh, western australia in perth we didn't mention that we should probably mention that um but in a few weeks uh, we've not filmed it yet but we will be filming it um because i do some brief work with him where i give feedback on efficiency in teaching and and, and, and i've analyzed some of the policies before they've been uh, published here in victoria and um a threefold plan I'd love to get across to him um, in a nutshell would be, and there's layers and nuances to all of these points, but we don't have time for that. But my would be, my three points would be, let's reduce the curriculum. And, and the reason why I want to do that is so we can create time so we can mm -hmm. put the human side of things into place because we don't have time. You know, we can, we can bring all these well-being programs into schools and have an hour per week for the class to listen. But trust me, I'm a, I've turned into a casual teacher to do the podcast and to better myself. Um, and that's come obviously at a cost, but what I am learning is these kids just look at these little moments as free time, a, a free DOS about lesson. Um, mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, these mm -hmm. teachers are wonderful who are doing it. They know their stuff and they deeply care, but these kids are just going, this is just a time for away from writing a math. Brilliant. Cool. I don't believe they're taking it in. I just don't. I see it. Mm -hmm. Um, it's my observation. So I have to say, I don't believe, but I, I, in my heart, I know. And so I think we need to reduce click and not because for me, well-being starts at the point that you wake up to the point you wake up. It never ends yet. Mm -hmm. We keep teaching well-being for an hour a week or two hours a week and put it into these business models and it's 50%. No, no, hold on. No, no, no. It doesn't work like that for, for me anyway. You, 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 you probably got more experience in that regard. You probably maybe agree with me. I don't know. But for me, well-being starts from the point you wake up to the point you wake up. And I include sleep on that um, on purpose. 
And but going back to that time saying what I said before, the point that I said before, we don't have time. Teachers don't have time to deal with that moment or that emotional imbalance or that kid that's hurt. It, it's all passed on. Oh, you know, you sit down outside, you'll be all right. Come on. No, we need these deep, meaningful relationships. We need these difficult conversations. We need to, these kids to, when they're not dealing well with something, I actually hold the space for them and say, and get them to do, actually sort it out themselves mm -hmm. and stop probing them with questions all the time. Give them time to actually think about how to have a difficult conversation with their friend. Yeah. And create a safe space for them to actually do it. It kills me. And then the and so many times I can hear people go, I think you should apologize. No, 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 no. That's what we want them to do. I get it. But we don't want to say you should apologize because it doesn't come from the heart. So that all they'll just learn in that moment is, so I'll just say sorry and we'll move away. Mm -hmm. and, and then they're building this whole new mm -hmm. trajectory in their life where they're going down the wrong path. We need mm -hmm. to embed it. And so we can only do that mm -hmm. if it's not being done at home. We need to reduce curriculum. I hate to reduce curriculum because we never used to. And it, but we, at this day and age, we actually need to. Anyway, yeah. I'm going on. Second one, change how we hire people because we keep hiring people who can talk the talk and talk about data and talk about data for them. I think English friends that are listening to me that will laugh at me saying that word. Um, but, you know, can talk about data in all that way. Uh, and they're beautiful in the, in the conversation, in the interview. But then they don't, they can't actually connect. They, yes. They're good at the business side, but they can't actually connect. And when we're dealing with connection as part of our job, I, I'm sick of the way we hire people. And thirdly, I've actually forgotten my third one. Oh, yeah. I've, I've always said introduce trauma-based training. And what I mean by that is the root cause of let's prevent trauma at a deep level. I don't, I'm, and we're always going to go through stuff, of course, and that's not what I'm saying. But I think we need to be teaching leaders and um, teachers and so on. And, and we can talk about other sectors of the, in different industries, but teach them about the brain, mm. <laughs> teach them about the brain and teach them the triggers. And, and when they can do that, they can actually reflect in the moment mm -hmm. and they'll go, Oh, that's what's happening. I love all mm -hmm. that. I, I do it in the teaching for the kids and the learning and they'll go, Oh, I'm so, uh, my synapses connections just connected. They're firing mm -hmm. together, the wiring together. And then we've got a code in this school that I'm at at the moment. I'm there for quite a few weeks and I've given them a code to remember. And now we're not mentioning it until next week because if they can remember it next week, they've probably myelinated the <laughs> neural pathways, right? If, if you know what I mean by that, yes, the yes. part of neuroplasticity, they're probably, you know, myelinated the neural pathway, which means it's embedded in their head. Okay, the mm -hmm. big question is, are they going to remember it in a year's time? Probably not. But you know, embedding those little moments to these kids, they're mm. looking at their learning in a different way. Mm. And then they'll take that skill set into something else when something goes wrong or I don't know. I just think that's what we should be doing. That's my threefold plan. I know we could go a lot longer and a lot more, but anyway, yeah. I completely agree. I, I completely agree with what you're saying um, because my hope and I guess what all my clinical experience gives me is this understanding that you can have all the strategies in in the world like you can yeah. have all the tools in your toolbox but unless you're embodying it it's not going to work so people aren't going to feel it and that's my hope working with leaders is to in, not just teach them skills but teach them how to embody it, mm. it it's got to be embodied for it to have an impact and ha and be influential so I think I think that's what you're talking you're talking about there, and yeah. and helping people understand as well how the brain does factor in here. I think we neglect just our basic uh, physiology and what gets in the way of us being able to be rational and and use our thinking brains. Our emotions get hijacked and take over the brain. Have you heard of um, Dr. Dan Siegel's um, hand model of the brain? Have you? No. Heard that? No, oh, he's me. a he's a neuro he's a psychiatrist and neuroscientist, and he's got this beautiful model. Uh, you can look it up on YouTube. Um, I also in, uh, highly recommend his book, The Whole Brain Child. Um, I'll write he, this down. He gives some very good strategies around um, and explanations around what is going on in the brain when we have this big emotional response and how it needs to be connected with first before we can move into problem solving and strategy. So, um, yeah, basically you've got the brainstem, 
the limbic system and then the prefrontal cortex on top. And kids, as we know, they are mostly run by their limbic system and their prefrontal cortex quite quite quickly can go offline. When a child or even an adult is emotional, their pre- prefrontal cortex is offline. So coming at them with logic and rationale and problem solving is, is not going to work. They're not going to feel understood. They're not going to feel empathized with. They're not going to feel like they matter in that moment. You're completely mismatching. So coming at coming to someone who is highly emotional or is having a stress response or is having a hard time, you've got to meet them where their brain is at. And that's meeting them with emotional, um, with their emotional brain, with empathic validation validation and empathy it's like a tonic for the brain it brings the thinking brain back online and then you can have that discussion you need to have but these are the things like these are the fundamentals that are really important to understand when you're working with people when you're trying to connect that you need to know how to speak the language of what the brain is doing so you can create connection it reminds Agreed. me so much of, I, I, I equate a lot of leadership work and maybe it's because of the season of life I'm in, but also all the attachment um, training I've done. But I equate a lot of leadership practices to parenting, you know. it's And, and what you were saying before, Andy, like um, trying to recall what you were saying around these little like moments of wellness that is dotted into the day. Imagine if you parented like that, like this kind of detached skills, pe- skills based parenting. And yeah. then just for an hour a day, you slotted in some warmth and connection and, and it, it create, it would create a very disorganized attachment style for the child. <laughs> it would create a lot of internal dysfunction. So if we're doing that in workplaces as well. It just doesn't have the effect we're wanting it to have. Yeah. It's got to be a sustained whole approach. You've got to come at it with warmth and empathy and curiosity and and um Yeah. I completely agree. I've seen I've seen it in the adult sense where I've been to meetings before and we've had lollies thrown at us to make us feel good for the meeting, but you still walk out feeling like shit because the meeting was always gonna go the way it was gonna go with or without the lollies. And I'm like what the fuck? Like, you just do the quick dopamine hit to get them. Yeah. To well, get it's them ticking here. the box, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. ticking the box of what they're required to do by their their leaders. Uh, we need to consider the well-being of the staff. All right, I've thrown them some lollies. Great. We'll have a quiz at the end of the month and we'll have a team building. Even team building, no. Oh, yeah, do it. I'm not saying don't do it. It's great and it's oh. fun at the moment. But it, it's not you – can't, you can't have that and everything else bad. Because no. It, it, most people probably won't want to go to that evening anyway. They'll probably will feel more anxious going to that meeting rather than actually looking forward to going to the team building. So it's That's pointless. Right. Do you know right. what I mean? Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.